periods. In English, we call it Shark Week or Ant Flow. In Spanish, it's called La Regla, aka the ruler, and in Chinese, it's called Taima or the big ant. No matter how we call it, every woman throughout history with a functioning reproductive system has experienced it and dealt with it in various ways depending on what time in history they lived in and where they were from. Nowadays, pads, tampons, environmentally friendly reusable cups, and super absorbent panties are women's allies during the toughest days of their menstrual cycle. But what did women do before these were invented? You're watching Explore Mode, and today we're diving into periods and how women have managed them throughout history. Exploring the history behind menstrual management is not an easy task. Not because menstruation is rare, but because women were shamed into not talking about it. Menstruation is embarrassing, it's shameful, it's something that nobody should know about. The truth of the matter is it's just a biological fact of nature and it's a sign that your body is working well. That's Alyssa Stein. She co-wrote Flow, a book exploring the cultural history of menstruation from the myths surrounding it to the role of advertising in how we view periods today. Like in ancient Egypt, as you said, people would use um, rolled up cloth or bandages, fabric, People used, well, free bleeding, and people would bleed onto straw or hay. People would use, I read, like a wood pulp or like soft wood to use in a sort of a tampon or a pad sort of thing. Things uh, that would protect the back of your clothing, like I've seen rubber aprons. One of the earliest and most peculiar mentions of menstrual rags was thanks to Hypatia of Alexandria, a revered astronomer, mathematician, and philosopher who was admired for both her wits and beauty. Stories tell of a student that had an intense obsession with her. He pursued her so forcefully that Hypatia had to scare him away by throwing her menstrual rag at him. There was, and in some places still is, a lot of superstition surrounding menstruation. For example, Jewish law prohibits couples from having sex during a woman's period and for 10 days after it until she is submerged in a special ritual bath called mikveh. Other religions also had their reservations when it came to menstruation. In all ancient religious texts, women needed to be separated. It was because they were considered unclean. Thinking of ways to make their lives better or to treat them well wasn't a top priority for anybody. Let's go back to the late 19th century, to the introduction of the first female sanitary contraption, the Hoosier Sanitary Belt. This chunky device held a washable or disposable menstrual pad in place using elastic bands and metal fasteners. Despite its uncomfortable design, women were still using the device well into the late 70s, when the adhesive pad and tampon became more accessible. It was for wealthy people. When the first tampons and pads came out, it was for wealthy white people because they were the ones who had extra money. Poor women couldn't afford it, so they just used what they could. So it was usually rags that got boiled at the end of a period and reused and stocked up in a closet. Do you change your life for one week because of that time of the month? The word period in reference to women's menstruation was set for the first time on American TV in a 1985 commercial for Tampax starring Courtney Cox. That's just 34 years ago. Remember, there's a feeling with Tampax. It can actually change the way you feel about your period. The absorbent material in menstrual pads was first used by World War I nurses, who realized that cellucotton, a type of cheap bandage made out of wood pulp, was incredibly absorbent and convenient to use not only on wounded soldiers, but also to absorb their periods. After the end of the World War, there was a lot of cellucotton left over. There were leftover badges from World War II. That's how, you know, they had warehouses of leftover bandages. And that's how it happened. That's how the whole entire industry started. The billion dollar industry came out of leftover stuff in warehouses. So it wasn't even like somebody had this light bulb moment and said, you know, these poor women, they've been struggling for, you know, millennia. Let's create a product, a, a product for them. It was just a way of using leftover bandages. Using this technology, Kotex launched its first sanitary pads and the first marketing campaign for women's menstrual products in 1920. 
Its name originated from the napkin's cotton-like texture, co-tex, co-tex. But more than a play on words, it was a marketing strategy. Women were embarrassed to enter drugstores and ask for sanitary pads, so the new name allowed them to discreetly purchase the product as well as establish the brand's name. In fact, you didn't even have to interact with anyone to purchase them. They had a table, and then they'd have packages wrapped in brown paper wrapping, and you'd leave money on the table without ever having to talk to somebody about it. So it was their original marketing gizmo, like gimmick for Kotex, was you like quietly take a piece of, you know, take a, a box off the table and leave a nickel in a jar, and that's how you'd pay so you'd never have to talk to anybody about it. But that wasn't really doing women any favors. Purposely disguising the pads and having to sneak the money into a separate jar only reinforced the fact that menstruation was shameful and shouldn't be talked about. The menstrual cup is popularly considered the most innovative menstrual product of our time, but actually it came into existence in the late 30s. The first menstrual cup was created by American actress and inventor Leona Chalmers in 1937. She called it the Tassaway. But at the time, the mere concept of inserting a foreign object into their bodies made women uncomfortable, let alone empty it out and reuse it. So in 1963, Chalmers' company, the Tasset Inc., went out of business. Tampons were also invented in the 1930s and offered even more freedom of movement than the pad. But although they were available, not a lot of women used them for the same reasons they didn't use the menstrual cup. This was a time when a woman's virginity was valued above all else, and people mistakenly believed that using a tampon would tarnish a woman's sexual purity, so they were often exclusively marketed towards married women. Because that was what I was going to mention, that they would advertise tampons to married women only. That if you weren't married and then supposedly hadn't had sex, you should not be using a tampon. So illogical. But another way of shaming women right? And keeping them quiet. It took a while for tampon advertisements to change their tone. And ironically, they began to target girls and unmarried women, trying to convince them that using tampons had, in fact, nothing to do with losing your quote-unquote virginity, whatever that means. With the grooviness of the late 60s and 70s came the freedom of the adhesive pad. No more belts and straps. The first beltless pad was introduced by Stay Free in 1969. They called it the Maxi Pad, and it was an absolute success. By the mid 1980s, the Hoosier belt began to disappear, and the rest is history. Decades after its conception, the menstrual cup is slowly but surely making a comeback, and this time, science is backing its benefits up. A recent report published in the Lancet Public Health shows that menstrual cups are as effective as pads and tampons in containing menstrual blood. Researchers studied data gathered from 3,319 women and girls who use cups and found that they were not only safe, but could also be a viable option for women in less developed countries who have no access to disposable menstrual products. In fact, there are menstrual cup companies that do just that. One of them is Ruby Cup. For every cup it sells, it donates one to a young girl in East Africa. They also use their funds to carry out reproductive health workshops for the girls and their communities. So there you have it. From rags to medical-grade silicone cups, menstrual technology has slowly but surely advanced. And for the sake of all women around the world, we sure hope Aunt Flo's visits will continue to get easier to handle. You know, when I wrote this book 10 years ago, nobody would talk about it. It was almost impossible to get it published. And so it's been really heartening in the past 10 years to watch how the conversation has evolved. And there are more people willing to say the word vagina or say the word menstruation or put something out there about it. Um, but just as, just as heartening as that is, um, advertisers and product developers work really hard to not keep those conversations from moving forward. So I say it's always like a step forward, but then a step back in this conversation because um, there are forces that really want to keep this secret so that they can sell their stuff. Thanks for watching Explore Mode. If you liked this video, hit the thumbs up button. 
If you want to explore even more with us, make sure to hit the subscribe and bell button so you get a notification whenever we upload a new episode. See you next week, and in the meantime, remember to keep your explore mode on.